Hello and welcome to another edition of the Arena Craft Podcast, a show focused exclusively on Magic the Gathering Arena. We don't talk about fun, new, exciting things in Magic, such as Modern Horizons 2, which everyone else is talking about right now. Instead, we finally, CGB, get to be the boring old podcast, which talks about old news like Magic Arena and not new, fun, papery news like Modern Horizons. How do you feel about that? Co-host of the podcast, Kovac Go Blue. So I have a spoiler card for Modern Horizons. You want to hear about it? Oh, yeah, I so I do. No, no, I can't <laughs> reveal it till tomorrow. And I guess we won't reveal it on the podcast since it's uh, the Arena bummer. Craft podcast. But no. All right. <laughs> no, yeah, sorry. sorry. Just had to troll sorry, you for gamers. that one. Yep. We focus exclusively on Arena here, so rip. Okay. Um, so, yes, we are, in fact, doing a podcast, which is happening right now, as a matter of fact. So... Mm. Uh, couple of topics we want to talk about today the main one of which is we're actually doing like a basic level up episode today and it is the scabs theory or whatever we're calling it here the <laughs> sab c theory what and i just like scams it's it's the scams tier it's, list it's it's the scams tier list right so these are things that people are doing and maybe you're doing in magic, which they think are getting them ahead, which are actually holding them back and which are scams. And so that's gonna, excuse me, that's gonna be the main topic today. Uh, we do have a number of other things to touch on before we get to that. So let's just bang them out here. First things first, our Patreon is continuing to blow up. We are almost up to $300 a month in people pledging, which is amazing. We have, I think it's wow. last I checked something like wow. 42 patrons. So y'all are amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, you can always find a link to our Patreon in the show notes. You can also, if you're watching this video, just look down below in the description, you can find it there as well. And if you're just listening, it is patreon.com forward slash arena craft podcast. We just released our first little patron uh, perk today, which is the next thing I'm going to tell you about. So if you were a patron, you would have gotten access to this on the day that we're recording this, which is a Friday, instead of on the Monday or maybe Tuesday, when you're going to actually listen to this. So what we're doing is we've come up with a questionnaire. And this questionnaire is basically a way for y'all, the listeners of the show, to tell us how it's going, to tell us what you like, to tell us what you want the podcast to be like. And it's basically a way for you to create the change that you want to see in the world via us. So um, that, you know, we go over a number of questions, just basic stuff like how long have you been playing? What kind of formats do you like? And then a bunch of questions about our podcast specifically. And the goal of this is to make sure that every week when Kovac Goblu and I show up to record the show, we're actually talking about stuff that matters to you and that you're interested in. So that's really like, I mean, we can talk about anything. Like I, we can magic-y just, stuff. I, know, maybe not the cream. Premier League in soccer. I, yeah, I come up right? short, but yeah. So <laughs> we're happy to talk about just about anything. And what we really want to know is what you're like the most excited for us to talk about. So this is kind of a big deal. If you are into the show, especially if you've been into the show for a while, here's your chance to steer the direction of it. And who knows, if we get some like really compelling data, especially data which shifts in a different direction from what we've been doing, then we might actually see some pretty big structural shifts on the podcast. So this is a pretty exciting time. Yeah, I really hope a lot of people take a few minutes and fill it out. It's Interesting because I spend a lot of my time getting feedback on YouTube and Twitch and Discord, like so much that I can't use it all, uh, so much that it, it actually becomes misleading if I listen to it too much. But on when it comes to a podcast, we have a lot of listeners, and we don't have a lot of direct interaction with them. So I we are trying to figure out what you guys are thinking, what parts of the show you enjoy, what shows you like the most, and what you want to see here. So just kind of saying what you said in a few different words, in my, in my own words, putting my own spin on it. But yeah, we I really hope you guys uh, out there fill it out. Love to hear from you, because we don't receive that kind of feedback nearly as much for a podcast, and it's exciting to see what you're into. 
It is. It is. So again, you can find a link to that in our show notes and the video description if you're watching this on CGB's channel. And yeah, just go ahead and fill that out. You can be part of making history. And of course, I will continue to, and we will continue to come up with other ways to just re reward our patrons for being those extra involved people by giving you early access and just cool little bonuses whenever the opportunity comes up. Next thing that we have to cover here before we get into the main topic is we have a question of the week. This is our lightning round, of course, because they always go by so quickly. And the question this week is from Discord user Mild Pro. Mild Pro asks, there was a leak for the Mirror Mirror event. Do you guys think the Oko and the other cards are balanced? So basically, someone released a leak of what the changes that were made for this event are. And I don't know if this is true, but I just hmm. thought it'd be an interesting thing to talk about. Seems like some pretty easy Reddit karma to just farm if if you just made this up. So I'm very I'm very cynical, but let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, let's let's do it. I, I thought it'd be a fun thing to cover, especially since we did actually talk about this topic uh, a little while ago. All right. So first on the list, we have Oko. Simple changes here. The plus two has been made a plus one, and the plus one has been made a minus two. This actually reminds me a lot of a suggestion you had made about balancing Oko. Mm -hmm. weren't, weren't you kind of moving along these lines? Pretty close. Pretty close. So I think I would have, I, I think I've suggested also just making both of them minuses, which would just probably be a bit too much. A minus. So that we right. just don't have too many elks in our life. Uh, I think that that's me, the thing that got exhausting with the card. How how many starting loyalty is Oko? Is it five? Four. Mm. It's four. And I think that's interesting because there's still this play pattern of when you plus it, to make the f when you plus one to make a food, you can still the next turn minus five to swap the food for a creature. Yeah, right. That's kind of a ripoff. Mm. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure that this is a solved Oko. This still sounds <laughs> just as annoying, but I guess Fry kills it now, and that that's the a reason somehow for optimism. So, would you go like minus one, minus two? Do you think that would? be a, an improvement i think yoko would be improved as a war of the spark style planeswalker with no plus because i just think that mm -hmm. it's it's just a better play experience for everybody if the amount of elking is limited because my mm -hmm. gosh does do those games get exhausting uh where yes, both indeed. players have okos and goose and are just elking everything they see so i will see i I'm, I'm i'll play it but i'm not i'm mm -hmm. skeptical that this one is solved mm -hmm. okay that sounds reasonable how about Omnath? They changed from drawing a card to scrying one. Is is that enough of a nerf? It's a good nerf. As mm -hmm. powerful as all its effects were, the drawing is a uh, uh, drawing was just the most broken part, in my opinion. Yeah. I still think that mana is too easy. I still think Fable Passage is just kind of a gimme. Omnath, I think, is still busted. Uh, yeah. But I do think it's a good move to take the draw card off of it. I think that was... I, I've said it before. That's the most egregious part of the card. I liked how we had it where reordering the effects on the card would also nerf it. And I think that that would be a solid... Like, if you changed it to a scry and you reordered it to make the best come last, I think those would both be pretty solid changes. So far, just looking at from these first two, these are very kind of conservative little moves. You know what they I mean? Are. I think it's interesting. Anyway. They are. So, and I think the next one is is no deviation from that. Field of the Dead. The zombies enter tapped, and it's now legendary. I think those are that that's great. It's great, but it's still a really busted card. Like it's a very powerful card. Yeah legendary means if you already have one and you play another one you do get two zombies from that exchange right and if you scape shift into like four of the legendary lands you still get all of the triggers yeah, so there's still exactly. explosive potential yeah exactly i think it you know so a change like this means that like the um the why am i forgetting his name the the wandering five drop that searches up Golos? the land 
Yeah, go so so I think with the legendary thing, the Golos combo is still strong. Yes. And it's still the kind of thing you could like put into a control deck or put into like a number of different decks to just like have that additional inevitability or win con, right? Which I think is like, you know, like Field of the Dead was showing up in a lot of random like modern decks as a one of to just get fetched up and provide an additional win con or generate some blockers for your opponent's Tarmogoyf or whatever. Um, so I think that Field of the Dead would still kind of have that clause. Making it legendary would give you that tension of that kind of deck building choice. So a good start, I would say, on fixing Field of the Dead. It's still, if you like fetch it up with Hour of Promise, you those zombies are still untapped if you have the desert and then you make more tapped zombies and you still untap with an army. So I, I, I think it's still a very powerful card, but I like both of the changes. Yep, I would agree with that. Uh, okay, Nexus of Fate does not have the shuffle back in the library now. It just gets exiled. So basically what this is, is a seven mana instant speed extra turn card. What do you think? I feel like I saw, like, I think it's really reasonable to see that one coming. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think everybody figured out pretty quickly that shuffling back in was the egregious part. This does mean it can now be in the graveyard. So if you mill it, you can cast it with like Scholar of Lost of the Lost Trove or something ridiculous like that. But I don't think that's very, very Ooh. likely to be a problem. Oh, Gear Not Hulk, with Time right? Warp around. Uh, Gear Hulk can play it, yep. But, that would yep. be sick. Now that is unique to Gear Hulk because Gear Hulk's an instant, right? Not yep. sorceries. Yep, so that's, that's an interesting one. But obviously yeah. a lot less busted and competing now with Time Warp and All Runs Epiphany in much more of a kind of a heads up where you have to figure out if instant speed and instant text is really that important. So that's that's my question to you. In a vacuum, do you think that the instant speed or the birds and the flexibility of the Aaron's Epiphany, like which which side of that would you come down on in just like in a vacuum? Something just occurred to me though. Mm. Uh, I I mean I'm not sure. I when I think about that, especially when you add in the foretell, the birds sound good, but it really depends on your deck, right? Like, are yeah, you a tap out exactly. deck or responsive? But it just occurred to me that you can now emergent ultimatum and you can select all runs epiphany, time warp, and nexus of fate. I just take two and, extra turns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Saltai <laughs> ultimatum is seven mana time stretch. You take two turns. That's uh, that's pretty dope. That's yep. messed up. I'm here for that, man. I'm here for that. Especially man. if you have another ultimatum. That's just brutal. Talk about ruining a really cool card. Like, Emergent <laughs> Ultimatum used to have nuance, and you had to creatively figure out how to put together your packages and things like that. And then it just got even more powerful with Kaldheim, and they added the extra turn, and it got insane. And now it's just two turns. We just yep. broke it into two turns. Done. Yep. I'm here for it, man. As a filthy ultimatum mage, I am here for it. Oh, okay. before we move we'll on, I just want to remind anybody who zoned out for a second that this will on these will only be legal and in this text right now in the event, an event that's coming out in July within Correct. Arena. Not yeah, this. So this isn't coming a, back to historic. Yeah, it's just like a test, you know, just yeah. kind of maybe allaying some of the or addressing some of the ideas that Magic players have had over the years. Um, okay, Wilderness Wreck, untap up to two target lands. So this basically just gives you like an automatic Teferi clause at the end of each of your turns. What do you think? I like it. I think that's a good one. I think that's a, a very easy way to get it done. Yeah, I, I agree. It seems it's still very powerful, but it's not like busted powerful. Although, do you... I feel like the deck just wouldn't be playable though. You know? Okay. Yeah, like the I, I, expansion explosion combo wouldn't be there. Like, you just don't you think know. it's there. What do you? What about like Gift of Paradise and Wolf Willow Haven, so that you're untapping lands that it's make thing. more I mana? Mean, it, you know, or, or running um, uh, what's that land that taps to add three mana? Right, the Lotus Lotus Field. 
yeah stuff yeah like sure that in historic yeah and you can run it in combination with teferi 5 so you're untapping lands with that so and just... untapping with reclamation so like your yeah. first reclamation is kind of a baby right you just have enough for a dovin's veto or some or memory lapse the second time you play teferi now you're untapping four lands you can cast rewind or other stuff and then the next turn who knows what happens well that's true it it actually does make stacking the racks a little bit more meaningful mm-hmm you know, because now you're like you're actually doubling as opposed to in the past, maybe you didn't get the benefit of all that mana. Yeah, and um, then you cast Nexus of Fate. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we really did it. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm gonna call Wreck fixed, actually. I think that that was like that takes it from worrying to I think not worrying. I think so. I think this is a good one. Okay. Agent of Treachery. The ETB only triggers if it's cast from the hand. God, that was easy. Right? <laughs> Just done. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, fix it. Because because here's the thing. It's still a pretty good card, right? It's still mm -hmm. it's still a payoff in a ramp deck. It's still a kind of card that you would consider putting as a top end in your deck, maybe a one of, right? Uh-huh. And yeah. you know, now you need to return it all the way to your hand with like a baron or something if you're going to cast it multiple times and copying it doesn't do anything and transmogrifying it doesn't do anything. So right. that's good. Yep. Well done. Well done. You're right. It it could have been that easy. Okay. Another one that could maybe have been that easy. Fires of invention. Casting cost is now three red red. I'm still scared. This one, I'm yeah. not sure that's a fix. I Mm. I mean, free, it's free spells, dude. Mm. Well, it's also true, CGB, that a lot of the best cards that people were playing off of Wreck were five drops, right? It's so, true. It's true. It's, you know, it's like drop this on five and get a free five drop on that turn is still pretty awesome, right? I mean, yeah, drop this on five, get a free five drop. That doesn't get to use your untapped mana like Kenrith, so probably different. Yeah. And then turn six, you play Vorinclex and a Planeswalker. Well, like, I'm even thinking, like, Yari and Luca would still be pretty good, right? Like, with fires, you could you drop fires on five, you drop Luca, you fetch up your, you know, Dream Troll or whatever. Like, that still seems like a pretty strong mm, deck to me. Vel Veramachus Lorehold, maybe, but yeah. Veramachus, I've, I've, I'm not, yeah. I, I don't think Dream Trawler cuts it in this format, but maybe the Lorehold does. I mean... Yeah, this is still pretty good, I think. If you're a straight Mima, you could just go for Coma the Cosmos Serpent. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm still worried about it at five. I think that adding extra red is good. I might even suggest like two red, 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 you know, just to Oof. like really yeah. make it hurt. I guess we'll really see. Make, make people mean it. Okay, how about Once Upon a Time? If it is the first spell you've cast this game, it costs one mana instead of zero mana. What do you think? I think that's good. Because that's now, good, right? yeah, now you can't easily play a goose from your top five. Uh, it's, it's like a tap land, but selection, but there's some RNG risk to it because you might just not hit. Mm -hmm. um, still a really good card, probably. I mean, just that's still kind I mean, turn one. If you, for one mana, can look at your top five and pick a creature or land, is that that's like better than a triome, probably, that kind of selection. So here's the thing, right? Does it make the cost of running Once Upon a Time hurt more, though? Like, because, okay, so you, you fixed the busted part of the card, but you kept the part of the card that sucked, right? Which is the rest of the Once Upon a Times. I guess so. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, so now you're going to more often late in the game draw that two mana, look at your top five card. I still think with Omnath in the format, you probably play it, though, because mm -hmm. Omnath deck just needs Omnath. It's true. So. Yeah, it's true. I, I mean, it's definitely still a card worth, card worth considering, and it could still be pretty good. How about Teferi 3 is now just Teferi 4? Hmm. Still seems really good to me. <laughs> I think so still too, seems man. really good to me. <laughs> pretty sus. It's pretty sus. Pretty sus. Yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, and you can bounce that know. agent of treachery and play it again. Come on, man. That's Come what on, I'm saying, dude. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. This this one is definitely not fixed in my. I opinion. really wish that they had fixed it in the manner that was often suggested, which is that Teferi just keeps the opponent from casting like 
instance of sorceries on your turn on and your not turn. not just yeah. shutting out all kinds of different effects such as maybe maybe that is the plan though maybe shutting down uh emergent ultimatum is now a benefit instead of just a cringe it's possible because yeah, back it's... then it was just killing the timmies now it's like killing the spikes yep yep indeed but yeah man this you know it's a fairy is it's funny how like of all the cards on this list, that's actually the one I didn't realize until now. That's the one that I'm the most glad I haven't had to play against. Like even just like seeing it and seeing the name and imagining our my opponent having access to that for four mana, it just makes me mm-hmm. shudder, right? It's like yeah. you still have PTSD. Yeah. It's it's, it's it also now you don't have to choose between Narset and Teferi three. They just curve. Narset to Fairy Four to Fairy Five. See? Oh, you know, you could do actually a benefit. <laughs> you could uh, you could do <laughs> Elspeth Conquers Death. You on five. I mean, <laughs> the curves are endless, man. All right, Oro. They removed the land onto the battlefield text from it. What? That's it. Okay. Yep. So you still draw a card. You still gain the life, but you don't get the ramp. Hmm. Oro without ramp and everything else the same. It, this it doesn't sound fine. It. You it, think so? I I think it still kind of fixes it. Yeah, because like uh, it like the front side of Oro is really not good enough now, right? I mean, no, it's still pretty good. I here's the thing to to hit the land drops. If you were going to get bottlenecked on land, you still have exploration and growth spiral. You know, like. It's true. Explorer and Growth Spiral are still there, so they can cover the land drop part while Uro keeps the gas going. I I don't know, man. Yeah, but it just it doesn't bridge you the way it used to, right? Is the thing. Like, okay. do, you, do you really want to spend your turn three or your three mana play now on on Uro in the early turns of the game? I mean, I've seen plenty of people play an Uro on turn three, not hit the land off it, and they were still fine because their hand was all gas. I mean, sure, and it still does somewhat help you hit your land drops by just drawing you into them. But I don't know. I'm, I, dude, Grizzly I'm, Salvage just went into historic, man. Just yeah, like, that's a good why, point. Why, why cast Uro? You can just throw it straight in the graveyard and bring it back on turn four as a full fledged six six. That's true, and uh, you know we still have like we still have our adventure merfolk and stuff. Like there's still reasonable cards to play to fill your graveyard so maybe it's not fine yeah i don't know i don't know if there's a way to fix oro oro you are incorrigible make it a two two (laughs) two two there you go (laughs) veil of summer now costs one and a green what do you think yeah that's probably good it doesn't sound like much but you doubled the cost and the jump from one mana to two with reactive cards like this is huge so i think it's pretty good Oh, it's still a nightmare with Nissa, though, right? <laughs> I mean, with Nissa, is Nissa going to be? Is it going to be the thing in this format? I, we'll have to see. It's a good question. Yeah, it's it's a good question. All right. Lastly, Winota looks at the top four instead of the top six. That's going to be really weird to play Winota like in historic. Look at the top four, then jump straight over to standard and Winota <laughs> for top six. That's going to be odd. Yeah, but. There you go. Um, I I guess... Uh, I, I don't know of a better way to fix Winota because tweaking the numbers on Winota, like any stats or casting cost, I don't think will change very much. But this is probably the way to do it, I guess. That, that's what I was going to say. The most tilting thing about this change is that they're still going to hit off of every activation and you're going to feel even saltier about it it because the percentage chance of it happening is less now right <laughs> that's what's going to happen to me is i'm still going to get dunked by winota and i'm just going to feel worse about it maybe it's it's a little strange right because now you need in theory you should run a higher density of humans but you still need the non-humans to trigger winota so the deck building challenge might be greater than it was in the past i don't know i'm probably just going to try to brainstorm some awesome humans and just put them there you know just to stack okay, the deck, I baby. Let's do it. That's pretty devious, right? Like any any good ones in your opening hand, you just brainstorm them, and then and then you go off from there. Mm-hmm. That's 
That, my friends, is how Covert Go Blue plays a Winota deck. And moving right along, this brings us to our main topic, which is scams in the game of Magic. So, Covert Go Blue, my question for you is how many times over the years of us doing this podcast now, I can say that because it has been over a year, how many times over the years of doing this podcast have we referenced the things that we're about to talk about in terms of like, yeah, you just really either shouldn't be doing this or you shouldn't be valuing this the way that you are. I, I don't know. A, a lot. I mean, a lot. It, the, with how much we talk, yeah, with how much we talk about magic, yeah, the the numbers could be astronomical. I, I, yeah. I, I I'm scared to speculate. It's it is a lot. So, um, and and I think that once we've talked about it, you'll start to hear it. Like once you start to think about this stuff, you'll hear it everywhere and you'll see it everywhere. And when you're watching people stream or when you're playing your own games you'll start to think about this stuff a lot more. Oh yeah. Twitch Twitch chat scams in particular. Like I'm really thinking a lot about YouTube comments and Twitch scams when I came, when I was like trying to come up with some of these really quick really quick. The things that people are just always like why didn't you do this as if it's yeah. gospel, as if it should be done no matter what. And so hopefully we can shed some light on the reasons not to do some of these things. Indeed, indeed. And furthermore, Kovaco Blue has come up with this what is now a canonical scale of the scam tiers. So take us through the scam tiers before we go through. And then once we know the tiers, when we're talking about each of these scams, we will, the two of us get to rate them. Yep. So scams are not created equal. And that was a big reason that I wanted to, like, we're going to talk about some things here and it's going to sound like we're very negative on them, but you still need to do them some percent of the time. There's a reason people think about this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, there is just like different levels. We've I've got a little scale. Just kind of threw it out there. And the S tier is this is always a scam. Don't just stop. Stop trying Still to make bad. fetch happen. It's mm -hmm. always a scam. Do not do this anymore. That is an S tier scam. An A tier scam is usually a scam. Most of the time when you are doing it, you probably shouldn't be. And there's probably something better that you should be doing. Something that you're overvaluing on general because it feels smart and we'll, you'll, we'll get to some of what these are and these will make more sense the b tier is sometimes this is a scam it can be a scam to do this it cannot be a scam to do this it's very circumstantial and there's a lot of factors at play and then the c tier this is rarely a scam but every now and then it is a scam so you need to know when those situations come up all right, I love it. So we have the parameters given. Now let's let's dive into it. So the first one here is scrying. All right, so let's clarify what we mean by scrying. Scrying is obviously a good thing. We're obviously happy to have scrying on magic cards, okay? Scrying in and of itself is definitely not a scam. The place where it becomes a scam is when people start valuing it too highly or when people actually spend cards on scrying then it becomes a scam. I think one of my favorite recent examples of scrying being a scam is on In Search of Greatness, which was that uh, two, it was that green, green enchantment, which the text on that card basically read, this card sucks, scry every upkeep. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it read circumstantial get free stuff, which was the part that I think scammed most of us into thinking it might be good but yeah it does say scry one at the beginning of each upkeep and almost everybody who defended the card would say well you get to scry hmm? <laughs> but cgb it's a free scry but cgb it's almost as good as drawing a card but cgb your card's doing something for you even when it's not doing anything for you what what was your answer to comments like that Kovac? Well, the main thing is that it's definitely not a card. The I think the one of the best breakdowns I've heard about whether or not scrying is a card is that there's three scenarios when you scry. The first scenario is, yes, I wanted to draw this card. I leave it on top. In this case, you were going to draw it anyway. You effectively didn't do anything. Unless, of course, you have some way to take advantage of that knowledge over the next turn cycle. But most of the time, that's not what happens. Um, so in that case, you l really did nothing. All right, second case scenario. You look at the top card. It, you decide you're going to scry to the bottom. You scry to the bottom. You take your draw. 
it's like the same card or something else of equal like uselessness and you die within the next x many turns before you're able to take advantage of what the cards under that may have been in that scenario you it didn't really do you much but card draw wouldn't have done you much either all right third scenario you look at the top card you scry it to the bottom and then you draw a card that's relevant and makes a difference and pushes the game in the direction that you need it to go that is so that's one of the three scenarios and I'm not going to say it's one third of the time that happens because this is a very nuanced thing. It actually depends how many cards in your deck would make a difference in those scenarios, right? It's it's not strictly like one third of the time it's the way to do this, but it does make scrying worth about a third of a card. And then when you scry mm -hmm. two, you're getting closer, you know, you're a little bit better than 50% of a card. And when you scry three or more, now you're very likely to draw a card that you wouldn't have reached otherwise in the game. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you're getting closer and closer to drawing a card. But uh, that that's the breakdown that I'm used to hearing. So what do you think about that? I mean, I think that's a great place to start, right? Magic is often all about heuristics. And it's just good to kind of have something to go on, right? Because it takes us from this kind of amorphous, like, I just kind of feel like it's good, or I just kind of feel like it's not that good. It, it, it gives us a place to start with actually um, trying to codify, you know, the value of things, right? So um, I'm definitely down with that. Another thing I wanted to mention was that scrying really is all about context. So I was just thinking, tell me, this just came to me. I don't know if this is true, but it kind of feels true. I feel like in general, uh, decks that like to control and decks that want to draw a lot of cards are probably the kind of decks that you want to prioritize scry more for, right? I'm thinking about, for example, like your Demir control decks that were running um, the... Uh, the scry and draw Castle cards. Van no. no, no, I'm uh, grave and lore. Grave and grave lore. And lore. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So I'm thinking like the reason why grave and lore was so good in those decks that you were playing is that um, your deck is all about answers, right? And so early in the game, you want to be finding a lot of answers. You want to be finding the right answers. You want to be finding the right removal. You want to be finding the right counter spells. Late in the game, you probably want to be finding your finishes or just, you know, the, whatever piece of the puzzle is missing. And I think that reactive decks benefit a lot more from that kind of selection. Whereas proactive decks are usually like half of my deck is threats. Some of my decks are better than the other. I mean, some of my threats are better than the other ones, but like, the main thing is that I just want to keep hitting my threats, right? And the way that my deck is built just supports most of them being good in most situations. And so scrying is less important in like a mono red aggro deck than it would be in like a Demia control deck. What do you think about that? I, I agree with you, but I think it's mostly because of the way that Wizards has decided to push the cards where scrying exists. I think that they yeah. view scrying as a control element for the most part. Mm -hmm. I So for example, there's a card in standard right now called Bronze Hide Lion. This is a green and a white for a 3-3 three, three, with then a bunch of text that never gets used. And it's not good enough to see play because two mana 3-3 three, three with a bunch of useless text isn't very useful. If we replace that text with when Bronze Hide Lion enters the battlefield, attacks or blocks, scry one. Do you think that's a good card? I actually think it is. I think aggro decks can and should try to make use of scrying when it comes in an aggro way, when it mm -hmm. exists in an aggro type position, because aggro decks also want to curve out very badly. They need to be able to play their threats on time, and they don't want to draw mm -hmm. dead spells late in the game. Uh, every dead land that they draw can and will uh, cost them the game as anybody mm -hmm. who's ever flooded out in a green white aggressive deck knows so i think a card like that is good but wizards doesn't make those cards well i don't disagree with you but i think one of the challenges is that it's hard for me to imagine a card which was not playable before in your aggro deck but is now playable because you tacked scry one onto it right? you really think so i see i think that that would push that card but so i think let's... that most of the time it's a scam <laughs> Let's take an example, right? So you take Bone Crusher Giant, and instead of it having Stomp on one side, you just get you get the Giant, and instead it just says Scry One on at the beginning of your upkeep. Is that a playable card in Mono Red? On on which side? On on the Giant side? Instead yeah, of the so two damage? Yeah. So basically, you you just you get to you you get the Giant like you ordinarily would have, right? You can just cast the Giant. You don't get the Stomp. 
but it has scry one at the beginning of your upkeep on it oh as well. you're taking stomp off the card okay now That's, now now no it's we're, not we're, playable we right? we went too far you went yeah, too far it's, it's yeah. not playable okay <laughs> Um, so the, the point I'm trying to make is like, ha, like how much value is the scrying actually adding to a card that we otherwise wouldn't play in our aggro deck? Right. Okay. And, and I, I see where you're coming is, from. Is it's adding very little, right? Like, I think that you're just, it's hard for me to think of a card, you know, like a card that's like right on the edge, but it's not seeing play, but it would see play in an aggro deck because you added scry on it yeah I, I think the lion example is a pretty good one to be honest it's a good one even like though a two mana three three play. is very close yeah i, yeah, I think if you close. just threw scry on that one it might but i, I also yeah. added it in gargaroth terms whenever it attacks or blocks which that's pretty good too like i mm -hmm. I, I didn't just throw a scry on it <laughs> mm -hmm. so but i i think the point that i think that we're both making here is that scrying is like it's like an afterthought. It's it's mm -hmm. really not the main course. And yes. if you're ever trying to make it the main course, it's probably not good enough. There's a reason I've never titled one of my decks Blue White Scrying Control. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, like, exactly. Mm, mm -mm, exactly. Nope. I also so, wanna before we before we stamp this, I've gotta throw this one in because this is a Twitch okay. chat like special. They love yeah. this. Somebody once upon a time discovered that you could scry on your upkeep and Ever since that moment, if there is a Castle Vantress five mana available and an empty hand or no playables, there will be people saying you're supposed to scry on your upkeep because you can draw the card, uh, the spell card sooner. And the problem with that is, yes, you might draw the card sooner, but you don't have the mana to cast it. You don't yes. have the mana to cast it. You need your mana open for the possibilities that you can draw into a good card and play it. And you reduce the amount of cards that you can draw and then proceed to cast when you commit your mana to scrying on your upkeep. So unless you have more mana than you can possibly spend on the most six, on the most powerful cards in your deck that you really want to draw, you don't want to scry on your upkeep. You want to just wait. You just want to draw the card so that if it's a good card, you can play it. Yeah, that's such a good point. I'm really glad that you brought that up. I totally agree. I think the only scenarios in which you do scry on upkeep are, let's say that you can't cast every card in your deck, but there are cards that you really want to draw that oh, yeah. would really make an impact on that turn. Or maybe you think like, I don't think I can afford to wait. Maybe I'm about to die, stuff like that. And you know, maybe you have like, seven mana and you spend five of those scrying but if you hit that two mana spell it's really going to change everything then maybe that's the time you do it right yep but yep um but i think what a lot of people forget is okay the nightmare scenario is like i didn't scry and i drew a land okay that sucked right but what they forget is that you then just scry at the end of your opponent's turn and you basically get the same value. And the difference is that whatever you scry into, you can actually cast on the following turn. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you didn't, you're not losing the value. You're just displacing it to a better time where your mana is going to be much more efficiently used. And you have the information of what card you drew for the turn as well, which affects exactly. whether or not you scry or what you keep. Yeah, exactly. So, so do yeah. You, do you think it's time to scam tier this? It is. It is. All right. So scrying. What What do you think, CGB? I'm going to go with, in terms of card evaluation, I think that this is a very important distinction to make. In terms of how yeah. we evaluate cards on whether or not cards are good, playable, strong, broken, etc. I would say that valuing the scrying is usually a scam. I would say that's it's an right. A tier scam tier. That's, that's where I'm coming down as well, actually. I think it is usually a scam. I think that, like... In a vacuum, if someone said, take take a card that's close to playable, add scry to it, is it now playable? In a vacuum, I would say no, it's not. Mm -hmm. so, I would definitely first evaluate the card on its other attributes before getting excited about the scrying. Yeah. Remove it like, from imagine, the card and see like, if you still love it. <laughs> like, would you play a cancel with a scry one on it? I would. I, I have, but I yeah. probably... Pro that was a different format. I wouldn't play it today. It, it wouldn't beat out your other options, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or like, 
Would you play a uh, like one on a red shock with a scry on it? Hell no, right? Uh, right, right. Yes. <laughs> so Agreed. anyway, so that that's what you should be thinking. All right. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is deck thinning. This is one which has come up the most, I would say, like when I'm streaming or when I'm talking to people or just like hearing people's evaluations or, you know, maybe thinking about when to crack their fetch land and stuff like that is deck thinning. And one of the things I was trying to figure out, Covert Go Blue, is if I could think of any advantage whatsoever in Magic, which was a smaller advantage than thinning your deck. Can, can you think of like a single discrete unit of advantage that you can get in a magic game, which is less significant than thinning your deck? Maybe the opposite, which is the reverse deck thinning of like shuffling a card back into your library with a Gaia's Blessing. <laughs> well, cause like that's actively harmful, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying, you know, I, I, I think what this is highlighting to me is I just can't think of something which is both better for you than not doing it, but which is worth less than thinning your deck. Mm, mm -hmm. And what this brings me to is that I think that deck thinning might actually be like the smallest advantage you can gain in a game of magic in a vacuum. Because of course, there are situations where if you have a chance to massively thin your deck, it can make a difference. Like for example, your Nissa ultimate fetches like 15 lands out of your deck and you know, every time I do that, I draw three more lands. You in a still row. draw more lands, oh, right? And that's what I'm in. saying. It's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, like imagine there was a card that was like one and one green mana instant, like remove 15 lands from your deck. Would you ever run that card? Yeah, there's a world <laughs> where you could break that card somehow. I like a Maybe. with a crackling Drake, right? And and your crackling Drake has 15 Maybe, power, right? Yeah, but like. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, it's just like, I think what this highlights is that even when you drastically thin your deck, you can still lose, it can still not matter. And it's, again, it's not worth a card, right? Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. They should make a card that's like seven mana, XL all land cards from your library, draw a card, and see if anybody <laughs> plays it. <laughs> It'd be and funny. Just tack, just tack on like gain five life on there as well, you know. <laughs> now we're getting there. Um, so in in terms of deck thinning, the way it works in a typical sixty is if you crack a fabled passage and you search your library and you put a land onto the battlefield, you now have taken a land out of your deck, put it onto the battlefield, and that you're now about one point three percent, depending where you're at in in the game, uh, more likely to draw a spell than a land off the top of your library. So the thing about the trap, I would say, in deck thinning, the scam, is that it's it's kind of right most of the time because mathematically it's correct. But I think that people really, really stress going out of their way to make this happen. And if you don't do it, they think you're strictly wrong. And uh, I think Fable Passage is a great example of this because it's the most common thing. If you play a Fable Passage and don't crack it right away, you will always hear people say, but you're supposed to thin your deck. You didn't thin your deck. You know what I mean? And I and by right away, I mean before you take your next draw within the same turn cycle. Whereas I can think of several reasons to keep a Fable Passage on the battlefield and not crack it to go fetch another land. Um, the My favorite is on MTG Arena specifically, it holds priority. The opponent mm -hmm. can't tell whether or not you have a heartless act or a saw it coming or a mystical dispute based on the way that priority is passing in the game. So very, very often I'll play a fabled passage and not crack it when I could strictly to hide whether I have these things or don't have these things. Yep. That's a really, really excellent point. Um, so some other examples of why you might want to hang on to your Fabled Passage are just you might actually want the flexibility of being able to choose which land you get, right? Yep. So having that flexibility might not matter on this turn or this turn cycle, but like two or three turns from now, you might actually have a very mana intensive turn and, you know, like a counter spell war or, or um, you know, let's say you have a, a card draw spell that draws you into like two black removal spells and one of them has a double black in the cost and stuff like that right so there are just a lot of different scenarios in which it doesn't matter now but it may matter in a multi-spell turn in the future 
Oh yeah. And you're going to feel real disappointed if you cracked that fetch land for basically no reason uh, before you got to that turn. A good example here is in rogues. Um, in rogues, sometimes you need the triple black because you need to play Luris and a Thieves Guild Enforcer in the same turn. Sometimes you need triple blue to play a Drown in a Lock and an Into the Story the same turn, and you don't know when. And the whole time, you would really like to crack your Fable Passage with a crab on the battlefield. So there's like so many good reasons in rogues to wait. Against rogues, there's also good reasons to wait. Every card in the graveyard is something that they can use against you because when they hit the right number for Drown in the Locker into the story, they punish you. So not cracking your Fabled Passage when you play against rogues can be the right play sometimes. Uh, all of these are things that you have to think about a lot. And I think that when people say, yeah, but it thins the deck, so I better do it. I think that as a default is very, very often a scam. I agree. I agree. I think... If there is literally anything else in your deck to do with that land or that cracking of the land later in the game, I think you should not do it. If you have a chance to draw a brainstorm, if you have a chance to draw a landfall creature, if, uh, you know, there, there are just, yeah, exactly. If having it in the graveyard will be better later in the game than it will be now. Um, basically, any reason. I would say any reason you can come up with to not crack that land is enough of a reason to not do it. Now, Fable Passage is a very low cost one because all that it costs you is your land drop for the most part. Another thing with deck thinning that I see just happen way too often is say that you're playing Emergent Ultimatum, right? Uh, you're playing Sultai Ultimatum and you're playing against a deck that runs counter spells and you're into a late game scenario and they have a card in their hand and you're not sure if it's a counter spell or not. It could be based on what's happened. You have enough mana to cast the Emergent Ultimatum that's in your hand, which is one of the last two cards in your hand. The other card in your hand is Cultivate. You can cast the Cultivate, or you can cast the Ultimatum. You cannot cast both. Very often, I see people cast the Cultivate because they want to thin the deck and try to draw more, better cards. And while that is a working strategy, I feel like it's also a cop-out because they don't want their ultimatum countered. And when you think about it, the opponent still isn't less likely to draw a counter spell off the top of their library than they were before. So mm -hmm. the longer, the more time you give them to find the counter spell, the less likely your ultimatum resolves. You improved your chances of drawing another relevant spell by a little bit, but considering how many ramp spells are in your deck, you didn't do that much for yourself. I, I think a lot of players would be better served by forcing the counter spell in that scenario. And I think a lot of people talk themselves into casting Cultivate to try to thin their deck as early as possible. Yeah, that's a really excellent example, and I totally agree. Um, as someone who's played that ultimatum deck a lot, uh, I quickly phase out of casting cultivates if I have anything better to do with my mana. Mm -hmm. And the only exception is if you have a good curve, right? If you like, if you're looking at your hand and you're like, "Well, I could cast cultivate this turn and then also, you know, play my binding the old gods," and like that's a pretty solid setup, and that's going to give you a lot of mana for next turn to maybe do another double spell then that's fine. But I think if you have anything better to do with your mana, and if the board state reflects that in any way, um, then I, I would just hold off on the cultivates, you know, just, just let them chill. It's going to be fine. So do you want to try, are, are, is there anything you want to add on deck thinning before we give it a rating? Let, let's just hit on reverse deck thinning a little bit more. Oh, um, good call. Because good call. this, this is a way that people will often straight up scam themselves. And this is not like a, this is not like a can't decide whether it is or it isn't. This is just like, no, that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Like, so here's a scenario. Imagine in a game where you multi six. And so right away, you scry land on the bottom of your deck. And then let's say a little bit later in the game, you end up scrying another land to the bottom of your deck. If you or have let's, two... let's say you activate an Narset and you know you put three lands on the bottom. Exactly, right? So in a situation like this, you, you at no point in the future for shuffling your deck will be thinning your deck at that point because you're just 
actively bringing in cards that you don't want. Um, and this actually gets to not just lands. Let's say you just have some cards that are really bad in the matchup that you scry to the bottom, maybe removal spells in game one of a control matchup or something like mm -hmm. that. And there, there's just a lot of reasons that the stuff on the bottom could not be ideal for the game that you're planning to play. And so in a situation like that, every time you shuffle your deck is reverse thinning your deck. It's thickening your deck. It's, it's giving you a higher chance to hit cards that you don't want to draw. So this is like, it's an important thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I've heard people say, I'm curious what your take is on this CGB. Let's say that you're digging for a card, right? And you've just, you've done like an incredible amount of scrying and narsiting and card drawing, and you still haven't hit the card. And then someone says, I don't want to shuffle my deck because I've already worked through a lot of cards in my deck and increased the likelihood of drawing that card. Do you think that that is a smart way to think about it? Or do you think that that's another scam? No, that's a smart way to think about it. If you have knowledge of if you have knowledge of how many cards in your library are not the card that you're looking for and where they are, and you would throw that away by shuffling to gain something that isn't of significant value, that's strictly a mistake. Like you should not yeah. do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you, if you know, because basically you're going from, it could be in these next 10 cards that are getting closer and closer to the top of my library. You're, you're throwing that away to make it like, well, it's in the top 39 somewhere. <laughs> it's, it is still in my library. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's true. So I think that it's just, it's important when you're making these decisions to just evaluate it, right? To just have that conversation with yourself. What do I gain by shuffling my library? What do I lose? And just make sure that what you're gaining is better than what you're losing. Uh, All right. Like big agree. Yeah. Deck thinning. Is it a scam? Or, or, where on the scam tier is it? Covagably, what do you think? So I would give deck thinning a B. I believe that it, deck thinning is very often mathematically the correct thing to do without much downside, which is why a lot of people default to it so easily. But what we've talked about here today, it is important to ask yourself, do I want to to thin my deck right now? Is that better than something else I could do? Because it is, while often correct, a very small advantage. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of other things that you could often do with your mana, your turn, and your timing that gain you a larger one. And uh, reverse deck thinning is an S tier mega scam. Because that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is definitely always a scam. I'm going to come in hot on deck thinning, and I'm going to say it's usually a scam. And this is not because I necessarily think that that's true. I just think that of all the things that we're talking about, I think this is one of the things that people are most likely to do when they shouldn't. And so I'm going to give this a cautionary tale of it is usually a scam. This is my homework for you listeners, crafties. Every time over the next, let's just say a week, or even just, you know, the next day that you're playing a lot of matches, just watch every time that you go to, you know, crack a fabled passage or do some kind of deck thinning thing, just check in with yourself and ask, is there anything better I could be doing with this effect? In your sweaty ranked matches, if if you run into me in the brawl queue, just crack your freaking fetch land and move it. I got places to be. Fair. That's fair. All right. Uh, next one we have here is looking at the opponent's hand. So, you know, CGB, control mage. Mm -hmm. how, how much value do you place on knowing what's in your opponent's hand? I would say probably a lot lower than most people. I think I probably place looking at my opponent's hand and getting that information as like an extreme side effect. It, it, to, the, to the point where if I play a Valky and it doesn't hit, I'm not even happy to see my opponent's hand. I'm just like, well, that card was terrible. <laughs> like, like, and, 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 you, and that knowledge, while it can sometimes be useful, the main reason I say that, uh, this was something that was taught to me a long time ago when I was learning to play Magic better by somebody much better than me, um, is that good players know what's in their hand anyway. If you're, yes. playing, if you're playing a try-hard meta versus meta match, you know your opponent's deck's makeup typically and you can discern from 
how priority passes and how they play their cards and how they pick out what to do, what cards are most likely to be in their hand and how to approach. And there are times when that's not completely true, but it's pretty often true. I think anybody who's watched me play on YouTube a lot, I, I think this is something I do more and more accurately than most of my contemporaries who post videos on the regular, is I look at their hand, I look at the situation, and I say, this is what they have, and I proceed uh, accordingly. And I'm wrong sometimes, definitely. But you also have to evaluate as you go, like what what do you actually give up if you're wrong? And usually the case is that you can play in a way that plays around what you believe your opponent to have or in a way that makes it optimal for you without actually having to see their hand. You can play a good game of magic and avoid the biggest pitfalls in the meta. Yep. I totally agree. And you see this time and time again watching good players play is that they'll play like their opponent has it and often their opponent does have it. And when their opponent doesn't have it, that they're still making tight plays that make sense that, you know, they, they have ways to use their mana. They're basically just making, you know, an informed calculated decision. And when you do that enough, you tend to win games of magic. So I totally agree. Here's another thing that I just want to say about this is how much information do you really get when you look at your opponent's full hand? Okay. So when you look at your opponent's hand, let's say it's early in the game, let's say it's turn two. Okay. First of all, you see X number of unmade land drops they had that you assume they had, right? So that's already maybe like up to half of the hand that you could just safely assume they already had. Okay, maybe they, they maybe that, you know, missing land drops, right? Maybe they're not going to hit their next land drop. But if that's the case, you're going to know that very soon anyway. And you can, and, and you're heavily advantaged in that case. And you can still adjust to make that an advantage that wins you the game, right? Um, next information you get. They have one or a couple of the cards that you expected them to have because they always play the same freaking stuff, right? It's rogues. How many cards are in the rogues deck? You know exactly what they are. <laughs> and yep, they're going to have some of them, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of redundancy in that deck. There's a lot of flash creatures. There's a lot of counter magic, you know? And so it's just really not that hard to think, yeah, they're probably going to have some of that stuff. Here's the next thing, right? So, okay, so you see a couple of lands. You see a couple of cards that you expected for them to have. As soon as they draw their next card, you know nothing, right? Like but they you, could have drawn it. But you think you do. That's the that's the part where it gets you. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I hope you. I just have to like because this is a hundred percent what I wanted to say too. It was like you walk into traps so much worse when mm -hmm. you think you know more than you do. <laughs> that's it. That's it. You know because as we all know. Like one of the arena shuffler's favorite things to do is like we duress our opponent, discarding their, you know, ultimatum. And then what do you know? Next turn, they top deck one anyway, right? So <laughs> yep. it's so what I want to say is that the information that you get is the briefest window of information. And that information quickly goes stale, right? And so I think like one of the best. One of the best examples of why seeing your opponent's hand is good is when it's paired with effects that were already good. So one of the classic examples you've given on this podcast before CGB is duressing your opponent before you like in a control matchup before you go to resolve your spell that might get counted, right? Yep. So there's a couple of reasons this is so good. First of all, a duress is almost certainly going to hit a card anyway, and it's almost certainly going to hit a card that you wanted anyway. So basically in that exchange, you got to take whatever card you didn't want your opponent to have for the small price of one mana. So you're, you're down a mana in that exchange, but because you're not down a card and because you're now up the information, it the, the conglomerate of all of that has added up to make that a very solid play for you in the matchup. Now, if Duress just said, one black mana, look at your opponent's hand, would you ever, ever, ever play that card, CGB? No! <laughs> How'd I do? Did I get a passing score? You're passed. All right. You're passed. <laughs> so, and, and Wes saying like, Never, you know what I mean? Like ever, there is, ever. Like if there is no game state, I'm I'm feel pretty confidently in saying CGB that if like if there was ever a game state in which you got to choose if one of your cards had that text on it, I doubt you would ever play that card. Mm, yeah, doesn't sound right. <laughs> doesn't sound good to me. 
Yeah. Like there's there's a card I remember this it was this was very early on it was printed uh reprinted and revised uh, I think it was in like antiquities at first Urza's glasses one mana yep. artifact tap look at target player's hand or target opponent's hand one of the two mm-hmm. and I remember being very excited about that when I was a new player because now I knew I knew exactly what was happening <laughs> but um I you're just a lot better most of the time using your problem solving skills instead of using Urza's glasses because you basically draw one card for being smart. And I, I will say this, I, I think a lot of what helped me be good at this was playing face up magic when I was young. Like I played both sides of the game so much that I knew exactly how things played out because I was often testing with my sister or with myself. So we played face up and worked on getting better. And when I coach people, we play face up and work on getting better. So if you haven't made any time to play some face-up magic sometimes it can help you with that skill but no i would never put it on a card that would that would be yeah. that wouldn't work yep. for me so so i think what the takeaway here is that the advantage that we get from looking at the opponent's hand is like maybe somewhere in the vicinity of scrying or just another one of these negligible things where like yeah it matters yeah, it might win you a game every now and then. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's not good. You always want to have it if you have the opportunity to have it, but it's not worth paying any significant cost for. It's not worth spending a card on. It's not worth playing a better card in your deck. Um, there's just so many reasons it's not worth it, right? Mm-hmm. How would you scam tier looking at the opponent's hand? Um, I, I'm going to say that it's usually a scam if someone makes a play with in fact okay here i'm I'm gonna say this all right if it happens anyway because it's just like on plan for your deck and you're playing good cards in your deck and you're playing good cards in the matchup then it's rarely a scam right Mm -hmm. but if you're making any kind of decision in your game around it if you're making like card choices around it if you're if you're one of those people who's like saying Oh, well, even if this doesn't hit right now, you know, like, for example, if you're saying I'm going to cast my Valky against this control deck on the off chance that they might have a random creature in their hand. But even if they don't, I'll know what they have in their hand. That is an S tier scam, my friends. (laughs) Don't do that. Just hang on until turn seven or whatever, or turn 10 and play that Valky like as a planeswalker and make your opponent have an answer to it. Right. Or or play it on turn two because it's a valid attacking threat against your opponent's control deck, but don't do it because you want to see that hand. That, my friends, is an S tier scam. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I would go with A, usually a scam. S tier scam though, if you're actually making putting cards in your deck or making decisions on it. <laughs> All right. Excellent. This next one. Necromentia. I'm going to let you take us into this topic, Kovac Go Blue. So why why are cards like Necromentia a scam? The most common thing that people want me to add to my deck to solve a matchup is a card along the lines of Necromentia or Unmoored Ego or Cranial Extraction. These are cards that normally let you look at the opponent's hand or, okay, you'd name a card then the opponent reveals their hand and you look through their deck and you take up to the all the copies of this card and you exile them from the hand the graveyard and the deck i think cranial extraction was like the very, one of the very first ones of these to come out a long time ago and necromentia is the current incarnation and this is very common it it seems that a lot of people think that this solves just about any matchup <laughs> by naming if you name the right card you just win any game by taking the best card because in theory it's like the four for one effect you take you get in a in a sense you get four cards for one but you just remove them from the library and the graveyard and the hand although nowadays you get a zombie or they draw a card when this happens instead and the reason that this is a scam is because no almost never not not never, but almost never, does one card beat you on its own. When those things are truly the absolute, absolute truth, the card is not a scam. If the opponent literally has one win con in their deck named Thassa's Oracle, your turn three Necromentia can end the game if you hit it. 
But if they have so much as a shark typhoon in their deck somewhere, this game is not over. And you spent a card that didn't trade for a card in their hand, didn't trade for a card on the board, it traded for a card in their library. And that's a huge difference because a normal game of magic is determined by the cards that have actually been drawn and how they bounce off each other, not the cards that are never drawn. Yep. That's a really, really solid lineup on it. Now, I think another reason some people get scammed is that the cards like Cranial Extraction see a lot of play in older formats, right? And so I think that a newer player could be forgiven for thinking, oh, well, you know, they play effects like this all the way back to Legacy, or it's, you know, it's really important in Vintage or whatever like that. The difference is that a lot of those decks like have actual plans that will kill you and you see them coming and you have a very small window to disrupt that plan. And if you don't disrupt that plan, your opponent's going to draw their entire deck and kill you in one turn. And so in, in a matchup like that, it's in the deck for a reason. It makes a lot of sense. You know exactly what your opponent's doing and you know beforehand that this is a proven way to deal with that strategy, right? But yep. I, the- I, which, oh, sorry, you're still going. Go. Well, well, no, go ahead, and then I'll transition to the next point I was going to make. Oh, yeah. I, but I would say, like, that's kind of the combo nature of those formats. And mm-hmm. I, I wish there was a tally somewhere. Wizards, release the data, you cowards. I want to see <laughs> how many Wilderness Reclamation decks still won after getting oh, uh, Unmoored Egoed. I, I want to see how many Esper Control decks still won after getting their Teferi's Unmoored Egoed. I want to see how many Emergent Ultimatum decks still won with their Kiora Best the Sea Gods and their Planeswalkers after getting Necromentia to take away their Emergent Ultimatums. And I bet the numbers would blow the mind of most of the people who believe that like this is the way to beat those decks. I mean, that's a perfect segue because what I was about to say is that the way that Magic is designed these days, and especially in the arena formats that we play standard, historic, limited, right? Uh, Brawl, right? Um, These effects are just terrible in those formats. And the reason is that magic is just magic is a different game than it used to be. So, for example, like you said, like when the only win con in your control deck was like a couple copies of Etherling, then that would be pretty devastating to have those ripped from your deck. But if you just think about the average control deck these ways, it has like an annoying amount of ways to win. They have creature lands. They have planeswalker ultimates. They have flying sharks. They might even run another creature in their deck for flip's sake, right? Heck, they just pull a Kahira out of the sideboard and beat you to death with it. (laughs) Exactly. There's just like, like, don't worry about modern control decks. They will win. They will. They have ways to do it, right? So... It's really in and and I love that you give that example of the of like the uh, ultimatum deck in particular, because like it just doesn't matter. Oh, actually, the rec the rec deck was the perfect example, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's just no there's no one card that you can remove from that deck that like turns it off. It's like you take the wilderness wreck, they'll just RO you to death, right? You yeah. take expansion explosion, yeah, they'll just shock you. They'll just like, you know, this it's like there was just no there was no angle that you could take on that deck to really definitively shut it down, which is one of the reasons it was an S tier deck. It was just very, very, very resilient to all kinds of disruption. Yep. Uh, take fires away from a fires of invention deck. They're still going to attack you with the big creatures. Like, yeah, they're take Oko out of anything and they'll still kill you with something else. So yeah, that that's the problem. You can't be trading your mana. And that's an important part of it. Your mana, your time, your turn for cards that aren't even on the board to, to just take them out of a library. Test of Talents is an interesting one that I've played more with since it was released. And the cool thing about Test of Talents is it counters the spell. Your opponent spent mana on it. That's a big deal. That's tempo. They put spent a card on it. They put it on the stack. You get a card for a card, and then you get some extra. You get some bonus on top. That is a yeah. lot better, a lot better uh, than a Necromentia. And the irony of that example, CGB, is that I think you would still agree with me that that card is sometimes a scam. <laughs> yes, it's still overrated <laughs> for that effect. I, I agree. Uh, but I think that it's a playable scam, 
uh, yes. as opposed to God, shut up about this. It's almost always a scam. <laughs> Well, it's the reason why if you're looking through tournament decks in like standard and historic, you're still going to see negates in people's sideboards instead of test of talents for that yep. exact reason. So I think that's actually, that's kind of an exception that proves the point, right? Is yep. that even when you put it on a very good card, it's still often not good enough. Yep. Okay. So Necromentia, where, where do we place this on the scam? You, tier? You're going first this time. Okay, I'm going to put this on always a scam. For, for arena, arena players, your win percentage will increase if you forget these cards were ever printed. Okay? Yes. So the, the one time that it's correct, you have other ways to win anyway. Don't worry about it. Let like Gabriel Nassif make that decision, all right? Just <laughs> never put these in your deck. You know, and then if if you're like, Within a week of a tournament where some big player was playing this card, you saw it do a specific thing, maybe you leave it in your sideboard, right? But other than that, just forget this card ever existed. Dude, if they brought dust, if you could dust cards in Arena, and we could all dust Necromentia, my life would be so much better. So, yes, I am with you. Just, yeah. just stop thinking about it. Always a scam. Always, Always a scam. scam. S tier. Right. As to uh, this is the top of the list, by the way. This is the top, crowning top scam. level. All right. This next one, I think Kovac Go Blue will be especially familiar with, spending a lot, probably making most of his decisions on his opponent's end steps. Um, so tell us about this next point that you're making here. So the next scam uh, is always doing stuff on the opponent's end steps. Um, because something can be done at instant speed, you want to do it at instant speed. Now, and I've got a few on here. Fetch lands like Fable Passage are one, cracking it on end step. Um, instants are the other. So just because a card can be played at instant speed doesn't mean you don't ever want to cast it on your own turn. Figuring out the timing of when to cast your spells is an important skill in magic that takes a lot of work over time. I remember the first time I figured out the right time to cast an instant on my opponent's upkeep instead of their end step. That was kind of a... I, I, I felt really smart in that moment, and I had probably played the game about six or seven years before that one hit me. Um, and I was like, wow. And I, I got I, that happened watching like a, a pro tour event where somebody did it. I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. And that's a situation where you don't want, you want your opponent to have to spend their mana on their turn cycle, not yours, but before they draw their card and either potentially have the interactive card they need or the information of what that draw is, if they're going to interact with your card. And it's a very nuanced spot. Um, but I think that most people default to it's an instant or an activated ability that can be used at instant speed. I am going to do it on the opponent's end step. I think that that is the default thing. And there is mm -hmm. probably several spots where you could say, no, don't get scammed. Um, one of my favorites, of course, is when the opponent is tapped very low on mana, right? And you can play an instant on your turn that you don't want to get countered and they're unlikely to be able to counter it or to otherwise interact with whatever the instant might produce, um, like a collected company. Uh, if you have haste creatures in your deck, doing it on the end step is probably not the greatest idea if you could do it on your turn and just attack for lethal. It depends what you're trying to play around. But there's a lot of situations where Timing your spells shouldn't be determined by what the type line says or the fact that I can do this on end step. It should be done at a time when your opponent's least likely or most like when it is most awkward for them to interact with, I think is a way to put it. Yep, that's a really, really good point. And I would say you were talking about the end of the turn. And I would modify as well that I think a lot of people just wait till the last possible moment that they can do it, right? So for okay, example, yes. if, they, if they wanted to kill their opponent's creature, they wait until the creature's in the red zone, right? Um, and I think that, like, it, it's really funny, actually. So I watch a lot of Deathsy. He's a limited streamer, a friend of the show. And he hops on this so hard about how people in limited just, like, they try to be clever and they try to hang on to their instants and cast them during combat and yada, yada. And, like... 
he just regularly just main phase instant kills an opponent's creature, right? Because he's like, I want to get that dead. They just tapped out for it. Like clean transaction, we're done. I never have to worry about this, right? Yep. Um, and so, you know, if you can't come up with a really good reason why you shouldn't do it now, you should just do it now and take, you know, just get that off the table, take that away as a problem, right? There are maniacs out there. I mean, just because Snakeskin Veil vale isn't in the stock list of <laughs> Gruel Aggro doesn't mean some insane person isn't going to play one and you should have just killed the Magda or whatever, or the Questing Beast when they were tapped out. Like, just yep. get get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing is that the likelihood of it going wrong, like by not doing it is just often higher than by doing it. Right. So mm -hmm. I think the fear is what if they do something else? What if they play another thing that I hate even more? Right. What if, what if, what if, what if, right. Um, and I think that oftentimes in a vacuum, the actual what if thing that they might do that's worse is they might just have an answer. Like you said, they might have some way to make your waiting actually work against you. And yep. most of the time, I think that the danger of that outweighs the benefit of it. It really does. If you have a reason to like last minute that removal spell, either on the opponent's end step or at the end of combat, you should have a reason. Uh, usually when I take a hit from a creature instead of killing it and then remove it on the end step following, it's because I needed to hold up mana to represent a counter spell because I needed the opponent not to play their other creature this turn. You know what I mean? Uh, if, yeah. if they're attacking me with a robber of the rich and I need to represent a counter spell so they don't play this annex, I'm not going to kill the robber of the rich till their end step, but it's part of a plan. You have to know what you're representing and what you're up to. So I think yeah. defaulting to end step or defaulting to the end of combat is generally a, a pretty big scam. Yeah. I actually really appreciate it. I watched that video that you did with Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. And one of the coolest takeaways I got from the many awesome things that were talked about on that was that um, he was talking about a case in which it would have actually been smart to let your opponent attack with a robber of the rich and cast a very good spell that they'd stolen from you off of it, right? Showdown of the which, Scalds, yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is, you know, in a vacuum, even very good players like you, Kovac Go Blue, might still misevaluate that situation because we're so conditioned to, like, don't want my opponent to get value, you know, don't want my opponent to spike one of the best cards in my deck and play it, right? And what, what Paulo so convincingly laid out was that if my opponent wastes their mana doing that and making a play which isn't actually that good for them, I can then exploit them next turn and put myself on the front foot and put my opponent on the back foot, right? <laughs> and so I think one of the things that makes him like maybe the actual best magic player in the entire world is that he's like very very good at catching himself from making lazy assumptions about what the right play is and just like really really thinking it through right and a lot of us don't have enough time before our rope runs out to make the right decision but just stopping to think about that kind of stuff i think is really good and definitely this it just turns on its head the heuristic of like always bone crush my opponent's robber of the rich before they attack with it right or always like like i think I'm sure you would agree with me that sometimes Kovac Go Blue, you do kill your opponent's Robber of the Rich before it attacks, and sometimes you don't. And the reasons you do or don't usually have a rationale behind them. Yeah. And I think rather than worrying about making the right play, I would just worry about having a rationale. Just get used to talking it through, right? And even if you're not a great magic player, even if whatever your rationale was was wrong, just getting in the habit of having one and getting in the habit of identifying things and you know trying to decide which is the better one like that's the muscle that you will have to flex playing magic forever and so like get flexing you know get working on it i'm tempted to go straight to the scam tier after that because that was a beautiful monologue but i want to mention really quickly a best of three tournament match of magic is timed I can't tell you how many people with less than four minutes on their clock put out a fable passage or some instant speed effect and then proceed to not crack it till their opponent's end step for no real reason while costing themselves 
time on the clock. I, I think nobody actually thinks of this hardly ever. But mm. just, just I got to get that out there. Like, turn one, Fable Passage. Click, 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 click. You just took five seconds of damage. You just, yeah. put, you just took five seconds of clock damage. Maybe more if you weren't quick on one of those clicks for no good reason. Just crack yeah. it on turn one and let the auto priority passer hit the opponent's clock instead. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So I think just to recap, because we talked about a number of things here, but to recap, you should definitely try to look for the optimal time to deal with or kill an opponent's thing, even with an instant speed spell, even if it's on your main phase. Mm -hmm. And here's a perfect example. I was playing a game just last night and I had a lethal flying threat and it was going to kill my opponent next turn, like guaranteed. And they had an answer, but they waited until my combat step to try to kill it. And which means they let me draw into a counter spell. I counted their kill spell. I won the game. It was like the most basic example of this. If they had just main phased it on their turn and killed my flyer, or if they had just done it on my upkeep, like you said, before I got a chance to draw my card, they would have won the game, right? And so just very, very basic stuff. All so right. where, do, where do we tier it? I, I'm going to go with, I think it's a good B. Like sometimes this is a scam. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I'm with you. Yep. Sometimes there are plenty of good reasons for or against deciding to cast something at the right or the wrong speed. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to throw a 50, 50 on it. You know, just, just think if you have an instant speed effect, just think right now, it could be 50% the right decision. It could be 50% the wrong decision and go from there. Right. Yep. Try to think in a methodical order. First of all, decide what the right card to cast this turn cycle is, and then ask yourself, when do I want to cast it? When's the right time to play it? Yep. Love it. Love it. All right. There are many, many more scams in the world of magic and in arena, but that's where we're going to leave it for today. I hope that this was helpful for you listeners. Please let us know if you enjoy episodes like this, especially we, we try to slip these in when matters are a little bit stale or you know, whatever else that was to talk about just doesn't seem as interesting. So yep. give us, it's, give us it's the fun. On that. Yeah, yeah, let us know which of us is a scam. Am I a scam or is Arjuna a scam? <laughs> who's, oh, no. who's the most scam Don't. on the Arena Craft podcast? Just kidding. Don't, Kovac, go blue. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to come out well in that exchange, man. <laughs> I think you'd be surprised how much people don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Send send all of that feedback directly to Kovac Go Blue at the Kovac? one in no, oh, one in best of one at gmail.com. Not a joke. Okay, all right. Not a joke. I, That's a real I email. <laughs> I wasn't gonna rat you out, but you you did it for me. So there you go. All right. Um speaking of socials and such, you can find the Arena Craft podcast on Twitter. We are also on where else are we? Twitch. Twitch.tv yep. forward slash Arena Craft Podcast. You can find the podcast on Spotify and various other platforms. You can also find us on Patreon. We are now a patron supported show. Arena uh, Patreon.com forward slash Arena Craft Podcast. You can find us there. You can also find Covert Go Blue on his YouTube channel. Search for Covert Go Blue. You can watch this video if you're an audio listener you can watch the two of us talking to each other you can think to yourself wow that's so interesting i'm looking at two humans talking right now by going to kovac go blues channel also sometimes our awesome editor bottle brush puts up pretty cool card images to help you along indeed yeah or other fun memes so definitely if you haven't checked out the video version consider doing it you can also read the fun comments and leave one of your own um, just reminding you all that we have that sweet questionnaire. We'd love it if you fill that out. It really helps us a lot. And the, with the goal of making this show even more entertaining for you. So it's really a win-win all around. Link in right, the description on, you, on YouTube. It's a link in the description just below. Go, go do it. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> love it. And uh, I will catch you next week, buddy. Have a good week in the arena. Later, crafties.
Do, 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 do. Those are quite the chips you got there. <laughs> or it, whatever they are. They, they, they come in a crinkly they's, package. They's crunchy.